Welcome to the Neuronal Systems Lab. In this lab, uh, we will be looking at techniques and um, experiments which will be used for investigating physiological underpinnings of behavior. So mostly the techniques uh, used are uh, related to uh, electrophysiology and behavior. Uh, so to achieve that, we will be starting off from the basics mm -hmm. and step through these set of uh, experiments which you can see uh, on the screen here. And we'll briefly go through these techniques first. And then uh, at least my plan is to uh, um, take up a problem which will require some of these techniques and then uh, go about addressing that problem. It's already established uh, result uh, and in the process of doing that we will see how these different techniques are used for addressing uh, problems related to physiology and behavior. Okay. Here is uh, what we call a rig uh, in which we actually carry out all these uh, um, electrophysiology experiment and sometimes electrophysiology coupled with uh, behavior. So it, it involves, as you have learned, uh, how the signals are um, recorded, transduced, amplified and recorded, which you have learned in your uh, first uh, semester. Uh, basically, though it may look a little complicated uh, from the out from the you know, first view, um, it is essentially uh, all the things which you have learned uh, in your first uh, semester. Okay? As part of the lab, uh, you will learn how okay, this can be used, how does it relate to the theories that you have learned in the first uh, and the second semesters. Yeah, so uh, let us look at some of the elements here and let me try to correlate that to what you have learned in the first semester and second semester. Okay? Uh, of course, because these animals that we work with are small, naturally their uh, brains are also small. So we have to, to see and access and manipulate or um, expose uh, those brains. We need to do all the operations under microscope. And so there are two kinds of uh, microscope, broadly speaking, that we use in the lab. Uh, one is this, uh, uh, what is called as... Um, a stereo a zoom microscope. There is a, here is another one of them. Uh, here is another one. And this is our work table in the sense that it is a uh, stuff on which we usually sit and uh, um, do our first exposure of the brain. Okay, or we say dissection. So, and then there is another kind of microscope which is. Uh, here, which you call a compound microscope, sometimes a fluorescence uh, um, fitted compound microscope, and so on. Okay. Uh, we'll see a little more in detail what these uh, do a, a little later. Okay. So the primary difference between these two are, uh, are this. Uh, in, when you are looking at a, a zoom stereo microscope, as a stereo implies, you will be able to see the uh, depth uh, as when we look through it. So uh, even you are doing surgery under the uh, microscope in the magnified condition unless you can sense the depth in vision we will not be able to uh, uh, pick or um, access particular parts of the brain as we want carefully with our forceps. Okay? Uh, so that's so for all the dissection operations we uh, uh, use naturally stereo zoom microscope. And these ones are um, rather low-end stereo zoom microscopes, which can go up to uh, a magnification from around 8 or 10 up to around 70 or 80. Okay? And that can be adjusted um, here using a zoom uh, adjustment for magnification change. And at each of these uh, magnifications, you may have to adjust uh, the um, focus a bit. Also, when you are having an organism here under and seeing through the microscope, uh, you will see that when you want to see clearly different depths, to some extent you may have to adjust the uh, Z position such that different depths are in focus. But given it is a stereo zoom microscope, uh, at any given uh, position a considerable um, amount of the depth is visible to you. So you may say that it is actually having a, a fairly large 
depth of field okay um, while in the case of these kind of compound microscope uh, who has an objective objective here and uh, eyepiece uh, here the uh, what you will see is often you can get very high magnifications but you cannot feel the depth okay so uh, but you will see uh, by making use of uh, the camera and there are ways in which you can track whatever the um, points you want to access uh, by changing the uh, focus uh, using these focus knobs uh, to um, access the portions we want or visualize the portions we want. Now, the, um, in this kind of compound microscope, usually the magnification is not changeable in a continuous way, which we could do here with these kind of knobs. Okay? Here, the way to change magnification is in uh, steps, and the way to do it is to actually change the objective lens that you uh, are um, you are having to so for example i can change the objective to this one there are two objectives here in this microscope or to this one you see the yellow one or the blue one here are here are two tools uh, that we usually use to um, access the uh, brain hold materials under the microscope and manipulate this is a tweezer and this is a fine scissors, okay? And we actually, in practice, we use much finer tweezers than that. I'm just showing you these four examples, okay? So you have already seen this rig, right? Now, before um, uh, going to um, explain different components on this rig, I will also uh, show you a yet slightly different kind of rig that we use in our lab, and which is uh, here, okay? And this rig has basically similar things uh, as before, but uh, you also notice that we have a slightly different, uh, basically a stereo zoom microscope instead of a compound microscope in this rig, okay? Um, and that has its own uh, reason. You will see that when you want to do particular kind of recording or accessing the brain in a certain way, uh, or visualize in a certain way while doing the recording, then it is preferable to use a stereo zoom microscope in certain uh, scenarios. Okay, uh, basically the components on this uh, um, uh, rack, as you could call it, is uh, very similar to that, and you will go. We will go through uh, each of them uh, eventually. Okay, so now let us uh, look at the basic. Um, parts of this rig so in the if you come here I will start from this uh, rig if you come here what you observe is this uh, this uh, chamber here okay and you can see it is uh, made up of uh, covered with copper mesh all around you can see that uh, this all copper mesh here okay called copper mesh and so it's basically uh, enclosure which is surrounded by a metal okay and there is a reason for that and uh, we have covered this portion with black because in certain experiments we don't want light to enter into this chamber so, similarly here too basically it is made up of uh, copper and then we have covered the sides with uh, uh, a black sheet of paper now if you this if you see here this portion is open so that you can access the access the microscope but when we do the recordings we will cover this okay so we can cover this this is how it looks covered so it can be open like that and okay so and then we can do the stuff needed and then we cover it. So the reason why this is covered is because this is what's called a Faraday cage. So when we uh, record from the brain, but in these kind of recordings that we do, of course, uh, quite often it is electrophysiology, which means you are recording electrical signals from the brain, you know, at different um, kinds of electrical recordings. Of course, in this setup, we can also do uh, calcium imaging or functional imaging because we have a camera uh, which can 
record activity and we can apply different kinds of fluorescence light onto the tissue okay yeah so but largely in the lab we have been using electrophysiological recordings and those are electrical signals and uh, fairly small uh, signals right so small in magnitude in terms of uh, volts so if it's an <coughs> for example if it's an intracellular uh, recording you must be uh, having voltages in the range of millivolt and uh, if you are actually using uh, um, a recording uh, local field potential or electroantinogram or retinogram which are all very uh, wide field potential recordings uh, then maybe you may have to amplify uh, um, much more and because of voltage in say lo local field potential may be in microvolts okay so basically there are fairly small signals that are being picked up and the electrodes with which we record these signals are also quite often very what you call very high input impedance electrodes so given these two scenarios uh, there is high chance that the electrode can pick up noise which are other than from the uh, point of recording the cell or the tissue or whatsoever right so to prevent that signals coming in, come from coming into this chamber uh, we have this uh, faraday cage such a way that and this uh, metal is grounded which means any interfering electromagnetic field coming from outside will which are at least of some minimal wave wavelength will get uh, uh, stopped by this uh, or get grounded through this metallic uh, surface okay um, so that's what why we have this kind of a metallic enclosure okay so it's basically a faraday cage um, now we said that we are recording from uh, these um, brain tissue neurons and so on so and these are very small structures so as you would have learned in your first and second semester uh, for recording from inside a cell we use what is called glass capillary electrodes and for uh, recording from outside the cell we may use a bunch of very tiny wires so how do these electrodes look okay so here is a example of um, a glass capillary electrode okay, okay so and these are made from these kind of glass capillaries okay which are pulled and uh, okay which are pulled and then what do you mean by pulled for that we use this this kind of a device which is a um, puller and it has basically a heating element uh, we insert the capillaries through that and then we will um, have some settings which tell about how much heat how much pull uh, and so on and that depends on which kind of capillary that you use and what kind of electrodes that you want to produce and uh, as you can see the electrode tip can be very uh, very thin okay yeah so um, and it has to be submicron because it has to grow go into the uh, cells quite often and there are other kinds of electrodes which may be of the order of uh, so that slightly bigger and form what's called patch on the cells okay so we use both sharp electrode recordings as well as uh, whole cell patch recordings and these electrodes are slightly different and within each of these case depending on the particular situation the electrodes may be uh, slightly different okay yeah so that is basically how uh, intracellular uh, electrodes are made of course as you would have learned we fill these capillaries uh, with electrolyte right to um, to make it uh, having a conductive access to the inside of the cell for making extracellular recordings we use uh, these particular kinds of uh, electrodes which we again fabricate uh, in our lab and they are made of uh, uh, fine wire and you can see uh, let me try and show you if you look carefully here in the tip there are there is this wire correct coming out of this this very thin wire and actually 
that wire is made up of uh, maybe up to eight strands of fine wire so they are individually very fine you know of the order of tens of microns and uh, these wires are then connected to this um, uh, eight pin IC base uh, and that's what we use in our um, recording system okay we will see how they are used uh, uh, for recording a little um, later okay now how do they uh, this electrode fit under this microscope so here is an example where the electrode is here placed inside this holder for the electrode called the electrode holder okay so let me take this out here um, and uh, so this is the um, electrode holder on which the into which the electrode is uh, inserted okay so you can take out the electrode if you want and put it back okay now i need to use probably two hands to do it yeah okay i've done that I tighten it okay and you can see that this electrode holder is connected to this box here which is actually uh, the first amplifier um, in the system okay and it's called a head stage amplifier and you in um, in the theory in the first part of the lab uh, you remember we you learned about different kinds of amplifier amplifiers which give gain and then there are uh, amplifiers which will or you will learn if you are not learned you will learn depending on the sequence in which you go about it so this is a first stage amplifier which may not actually give a lot of gain but you have to see this this signal from this amplifier goes through this wire here uh, and then all the way all the way under this and then it goes into under behind this into this box okay goes into this box here so it's traveling quite a bit in the air right and it is outside the faraday cage so which means that outside the cage it may actually pick up some noise and so on and so and also there are reasons for uh, because of which when you insert the electrode into the cell and if there are no such amplifiers it may it may overwhelm the cell okay by uh, drawing current from that so there are various reasons because of which we need a what is called high input impedance amplifier at the front end hmm? yeah. and this whole system uh, as you can see uh, i i uh, moved around like this is mounted on this stuff which we call the micro manipulator why do we need a micro manipulator because um, our the electrodes have to be inserted into a cell or a neuron right and it has to stay there in a particular location so if i inserted the cell by moving certain this electrode up and down and forward and backward and then <clears throat> it should stay there and first of all i should be able to move small distances because I, I am in one cell it should not move and go into another cell and so on right so all this is taken care of by this micro manipulator which on which you can move very small distances sub micron distances and once you have moved a particular location if the micro manipulator is good it will stay stable in that location okay so and here that's also micro manipulator this is also a micro manipulator okay but this is a much cheaper and coarser micro manipulator in some scenarios you know, probably don't need such high precision suppose you are doing eeg recording or even local field potentials then your area of uh, interest is very broad and then it can uh, you probably don't need very fine movement but stability okay yeah so in those cases this one may be sufficient and of course quite uh, often in big labs you may find sophisticated light source because you need because you're magnifying you need fair amount of light on the uh, sample but we use this cheap uh, uh, led torches and that's good enough for our purpose okay here is uh, another manipulator okay this is a slightly different type but does the same thing and here is the electrode holder and here you can see it is mounted vertically electrode is yeah. inserted from here into this yeah so unlike going horizontally or at an angle there here the electrodes are placed so that it can move vertically down and because that depends on the kind of recording or the region of from where you are recording 
And in either case, whether it is this micro manipulator or the one which you saw in the other side, you would see that manipulation or control is done remotely. For example, this is how you control by moving these X, Y, Z um, knobs, you can change the position of these uh, by very small amounts, like submicrons. And uh, such um, um, manipulator controller on this rig looks like this. Okay. Why this manipulator, as I showed, showed is not a very uh, fine one, is actually uh, manipulated directly by hand using these knobs. Okay, so it directly causes movement of this. So. Let us uh, systematically look at what are the components in a rig. Okay, so for example, here is a rig where you can see a microscope. Uh, there is a micro manipulator. Uh, there is a vibration isolation table so that when you walk around or the building shakes or uh, things like that, the vibrations do not get transferred to the point uh, of the tissue and the electrode because as you know the position of the tip of the electrode with respect to the cell has to be maintained at sub-micron um, distances. So once you get into a cell or uh, you are um, patched onto a cell then you would want to make sure that the electrode and the cell maintain same relative position and the vibrations uh, from this floor get easily transferred you cannot see it but when you do the recording without a, a vibration isolation table you will be able to make out the difference and uh, as we saw before uh, here is the uh, um, micro manipulator onto which uh, the head stage uh, of the micro amplifier is attached and the electrode is attached to that okay often the sample is perfused with some kind of saline uh, depending on which system you work with the saline can change of course we are, you are visualizing all this through this uh, uh, stereo zoom microscope in this case and in the other rig of course it is a compound microscope which you may visualize on the screen using the camera and these micro manipulators are controlled by the controller as I explained uh, before and if you go to uh, onto the rack uh, adjacent to the in part of the rig on the rack there are a number of elements of course there is a controller uh, powering the um, micro manipulator and this is the main amplifier so from the head stage the lead go through and connects to the back of this amplifier and there are uh, a couple of kinds of amplifiers and here is an amplifier where uh, you will only see uh, ports you don't see any control knobs or anything on this and there are other amplifiers which you would see on the other rig which has all those kind of knobs which are older kind of amplifiers naturally from the amplifier uh, the signal has to go to the digital acquisition system and from the acquisition system which is actually controlled by uh, the computer, the data gets recorded on the hard disk or whatever storage device you have. Amplifier is of course required to condition signal to the necessary voltage levels that would be uh, digitizable as well as uh, it may do the job of filtering between certain bandwidths which may in some amplifiers be set on the front panel or using software on the computer. Okay. Basically, this entire system uh, does the job of uh, a sound card. You know, here is a sound card which would be on your computer or a, your mobile phone. There are ports for a uh, microphone. Microphone is connected to that. Uh, it gets amplified, digitized and can get recorded. So this is the trace of the speech that you made. And uh, the, this system is very analogous to that. Here is an amplifier, uh, the signal pickup from the electrode amplified, digitized and you can visualize it and it's stored on the uh, screen. Quite often of course you attach a speaker to this uh, channel so that you can monitor the um, sound happening and the sound is uh, audible to you in the in, in its uh, same unprocessed way because these signals are in the uh, kilohertz range which is your audible range. So as long as you sufficiently amplify it and feed it to a speaker you can listen to what is happening at the tip of the electrode. 
let us go through these uh, very basic um, uh, modules which make up this lab. So of course uh, we will uh, look at basic circuits and, and instrumentation because it forms the uh, core of the requirements for understanding what is going on in this lab and sometimes you may have to even build things uh, to do the experiment that you want because it may not be readily available uh, off the shelf or it may be too expensive if you buy it and you may be able to make it. So we will see uh, in this part 1 plus part 2 how you go about understanding the basic circuit and how you will go about using that understanding in uh, using the instruments, sometimes making instruments as well as um, conditioning the signal what you should take care even when you use the instruments to um, record the signals properly and uh, anal so that you can analyze it without loss of information uh, from the um, system that you are recording from. And then we will uh, move on to this uh, very commonly used technique um, intercellular recording from uh, single neurons using glass capillaries and a similar electrode can also be used for uh, field potential recordings uh, and both of these can be done using uh, glass electrodes. Field potential recording can also be carried out uh, in, uh, using other techniques uh, like metal electrodes. Um, but we will be uh, looking at an example where we will uh, use glass electrode um, for doing field potential recording. When you say glass electrodes, these are as we have seen in your uh, theory class, uh, glass capillaries which we will pull in a pipette puller and then uh, make very sharp ends and we will fill an electrolyte inside and connect the electrolyte to the amplifier using a silver silver chloride wire and the electrode can be inserted either into the cell in the case of uh, intracellular or into the tissue uh, where you are interested in the case of a field potential recording and depending on which technique you may have to pull the electrodes with appropriate settings so that you will get small or large diameter electrodes. Now, uh, one of the most common uh, techniques which uh, uh, everybody can do easily uh, in terms of electrophysiology is electroretinogram. It's a, uh, another one is a single cell cellular recording. Both of these are extracellular recording. One is a large um, field recording where you measure the activity of many uh, neurons uh, in the from of the reti from the retina. Okay, in the insect, of course, the retina is the eye that is visible outside, uh, just believe that. Uh, and if it's a mammalian system, the retina is far away, but you will still be placing the electrode uh, on the surface visible to you. So this are, is a recording which is done uh, without opening up the animal. Same way, single cell cell lamp recording is a recording from the antenna, the olfactory sensory uh, uh, transduction point. And Sensilla has many recep uh, receptor neurons as you would have already uh, learned and this enables you to record from those neurons extracellularly. So here you are measuring uh, the action potentials generated in these uh, sensory neurons. To monitor large number of neurons in the brain, uh, one of the most commonly used technique is uh, multi-electrode recording uh, implanted or uh, inserted into the appropriate area. The tetrode is a very common uh, type of such extracellular electrode where a number of wires are wound together to form the electrodes. But of course, there are other uh, techniques for monitoring a uh, large number of neurons simultaneously like calcium imaging or voltage sensitive dyes which are called functional imaging techniques. But in our lab, uh, mostly we use uh, tetrode recording for this. Of course, there is the data or the signal uh, received from the tetrode uh, recordings, the multi-channel uh, recordings, are uh, have to be processed, pre-processed using techniques called spike sorting to figure out uh, from a given neuron which all spikes came and how many such neurons you have recorded from and so on. Okay, and then of course we have to analyze this time series data of spike timings and. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, basic technique is uh, plotting a very stimulus histogram. So you will see how these processes are done. Okay, so uh, either using MATLAB or um, uh, one of the softwares which you are um, scripting programs that you are familiar with. And of course, uh, we need to have some behavioral assays which in which we can assay various uh, different things. And one two commonly used techniques in our lab is visual motor response uh, assay and a classical conditioning assay. 
for both of these we actually use uh, honeybees uh, as a model system and we'll see what model systems we are using in the lab later okay <clears throat> and sometimes we have to um, couple behavior with physiology so there are some issues of synchronizing the signals and so on so to give an idea of how such recordings and issues dealing with such uh, recordings we will do a simple uh, essay in which uh, we can do classical conditioning along with the uh, m17 muscle recording which is a muscle which controls the proboscis uh, extension in bees so per conditioning is the classical conditioning and recording from muscle m17 is the motor readout uh, from this system so that's a summary of uh, such experiments that we will be using and in the lab uh, we will be uh, using mostly two common um, uh, common animals uh, one of them is uh, this grasshopper uh, hieroglyphus banian and other is uh, honeybees okay and uh, for grasshopper we use this particular species and for honeybees we use either apis mellifera or which is actually the European uh, bee or Western bee it's called and Apis dorsata which is not shown in the picture here the, but you must have seen them hanging on the rocks or the tree you know big hives which is very common throughout India okay now uh, hieroglyphus banyan is not the most commonly used uh, grasshopper system okay uh, or in fact we are the lab which first standardized this organism for uh, studying uh, grasshopper brain or using grasshopper brain as a model system um, in the um, literature you will see that most work um, in grasshopper related uh, um, uh, systems is done in Schistocerca americana or locusta migratoria or sometimes uh, Schistocerca uh, gregaria most likely uh, Schistocerca americana especially in the olfactory system a lot of work has come from uh, uh, Jill Lawrence lab and uh, his uh, uh, what you call children right for example um, uh, Stoffer with whom I did my postdoc so they have been working a lot on this system this system is very good because uh, uh, it enables you to do extremely good physiology I both intracellular uh, multi uh, neuron simultaneous intracellular multi electrode recording to do you know monitoring large number of neurons do electrical stimulation of certain set of neurons uh, pharmacology to manipulate uh, the the synaptic transmission and so on so it's a very robust system for electrophysiology and maybe to some extent for innate behavior like looming response and so on but it has not been a very good system to study learning and memory uh, though there are some preliminary works uh, out there while honeybees are systems which are not that uh, easy to work with for electrophysiology but extremely good uh, for behavior especially learning and memory assays and <coughs> Apis mellifera is the most commonly used uh, bee uh, and, uh, for studying this but in, uh, it's not uh, native to the Asia so we in our lab have standardized Apis uh, dorsata uh, model system for uh, studying this and we have shown that Apis dorsata can be used as effectively as Apis mellifera for these studies. Here is how it looks uh, inside the head of the grasshopper. If so if you open up the head, uh, you're removing the cuticle and this is the uh, drawing of the brain. And here is an actual uh, picture through the microscope. This yellow structure is the brain of the grasshopper. And you may put various electrodes to do the recording. Here is another schematic of how it would look with uh, perfusion, uh, electrodes, okay, different kinds. And, and stimulus in this case order being applied and you may do various kinds of manipulation to the antenna to uh, make measurements or you may apply visual stimulus to the eye okay and in the case of uh, B uh, I have shown a sequence of steps when you as soon as soon as you remove the cuticle the bees uh, um, inside the head capsule looks like this these are the three ocelli the two eyes are here and what you see on the surface here is an air sac I have removed the air sac in this picture and if you remove this yellow colored stuff which is actually the pharyngeal glands and in young bees uh, they are visible and on one side pharyngeal glands I have removed and you can see that uh, uh, if you remove uh, yet another layer of air sac you can see the brain here one half of the brain so the other side I have 
sort of kept uh, pharyngeal gland. The anterior lobe comes here. This is the huge optic lobe. This is the protocellar. Okay, and those layers are still attached. So this is how the brain of the bee looks, and the antenna base uh, is visible here. From there, the antenna nerve goes into the antenna lobe here, and mushroom body will be here. You can see the alpha lobe when you actually look at it around here, and so on. And these are two behavioral paradigms that we use. This one for the bee ear conditioning. The bee is sitting here tethered, and you can see at this point uh, the order is coming, and uh, in this particular bee is extending the proboscis. And uh, this is actually a test uh, trial, so you are not really giving any sucrose to the bee to extend the proboscis. It has already learned that the particular order which is coming through this tube is actually cause um, rewarding, so it's extended the proboscis. Here is an optomotor response system uh, and here is a ball on which actually a bee is standing here which you can't see clearly. It's tethered by the thorax and there is a sensor here which monitors the motion of this ball and uh, the ball is actually floating in air which is given through this and the, you can do multiple kinds of experiments, uh, some of them closed loop uh, in which um, the bee is uh, moving the ball uh, in such a way and then the reading from of the ball position is uh, carried out using the sensor and a controller actually changes the um, light in response to this ball movement. So the bee can be made to feel uh, a certain rate of change in the environment when the, it is doing some action which is like walking and turning the ball. Or it may be open loop simply that you are applying the stimulus uh, in a certain way and then you are monitoring what the bee is doing in terms of walking uh, when uh, the stimulus is applied. Here uh, you see a few uh, instruments which are commonly used in the lab, um, not necessarily immediately for recording but uh, for analyzing data for us to diagnose the problem with the circuit and so on. Okay, so here is a power supply which will power maybe the instruments you have built or some of the existing devices in the lab. Sometimes you may have to generate uh, different kinds of periodic waveforms which you will either apply to the system you are studying or for generating certain kinds of stimulus and so on. So here is a single generator which can generate uh, sinusoid, square, triangle and so on. And here is an example of uh, a sinusoid which this system has generated. And so this single generator, you can specify the frequency uh, of those, the periodicity which you want, or whichever waveform you are generating, as well as the amplitude of the uh, signal that you are generating. And it has a BNC, bayonet navy connector, somewhere here. And that bayonet navy connector would look like this, which has got an outer. Uh, conductor and an inner conductor. Outer conductor usually forms a ground and inner conductor is the one in which the signal is going on. And extension cable also of this, this BNC cable also has a similar scheme as this. Okay, So there is a cable running from here all the way into this and this signal generator is generating sinusoid and is visible on the oscilloscope. And oscilloscope is a device which will display voltage changes with respect to time. Okay, So x-axis is time and y-axis is voltage. Independent of what uh, is the signal that you are studying, the scope itself will require voltage as input in this channel. Okay, So uh, if you are measuring some other parameters, say for example light intensity or uh, pressure exerted by limb, um, or any such uh, uh, parameter that you are measuring, that quantity you will have to transduce and make it a voltage and then condition it in terms of amplification then feed it into the oscillo oscilloscope for display. Of course, you may also be actually recording these signals but immediately as you do the experiment if you want to observe what is going on in the point of uh, the recording of course you need to monitor it and oscilloscope is a big device uh, commonly used to do that. Okay. Now uh, in this oscilloscope there are two channels which means simultaneously you can measure two different signals. Okay. The in the in reality uh, the oscilloscope sort of looks like uh, this here is uh, an example of an oscilloscope and this is on now and you can see that there are actually in this oscilloscope four channels one two three four okay 
and I have connected a probe to the channel number 2 and I have only turned on channel number 2. You can say for example turn on channel number 1 by pressing this. Now you will see a yellow line came which is for the channel number 2. So you can turn on any of these uh, channels as you want. If I touch this probe you can see uh, a waveform being displayed. This is a 50 hertz my body is picking up from uh, the wire power line noise so uh, you will see as yes, uh, or maybe you already seen in the video the faraday cage which we talked about that all is one of the things which it insulates the recording point from is this uh, noise okay as you can see uh, uh, a, uh, it can easily pick up uh, my body is picking up the signal your amplifier uh, input in from the recording point also may be picking up some signal like that so this oscilloscope can monitor uh, uh, four different channels so and I am only using one channel as you can see. There are two basic controls on each of the channels in the oscilloscope. One for the x-axis and one for the y-axis and in the x-axis of course it is time so you have to prescribe how much time per division, division being from here to here is how many milliseconds or seconds for example here you can read off now that it is set at 500 milliseconds per division which means this width is 500 millisecond okay similarly there will be one division set for the y-axis between this and this and here it is set for channel 2 to be 1 volt per division okay for, while for channel 1 which we also have turned on it is set at 100 millivolt per division and as I said earlier the voltages per division can be set for each channel individually while the time divisions are set for all channels at the same time the same way now if you look at the channel 2 you can see that there is some kind of waveform and which is whose shape is not resolvable at this uh, time scale so uh, we will try to make it resolvable by uh, changing the time division okay and so the way to change it is using this scale uh, or just called the time scale okay so I'm going to turn the time scale now and see whether I can make this waveform clearer and here you can see it's a periodic waveform which has a particular shape and we are able to read out the uh, shape roughly at a time scale when this 10 milli millisecond per division and so let us uh, count number of divisions occupied by one period of the waveform so it's say for example starting from here to here right uh, so that is one uh, cycle and so that is occupied by two uh, such divisions which means that is 20 milliseconds so 20 milliseconds would be that this waveform has uh, a period of 20 millisecond which will be equivalent to a frequency of 50 hertz now um, suppose we would like to see it enlarge on the y-axis then we can change the y-axis scale so for example now I have changed the y-axis scale to read 200 millivolt per division compared to 1 volt per division which was it was previously now suppose you suspect that there is a finer waveform riding on top of this we can change the time base further to see if that is true okay so let us change that look here uh, i am not able to see anything very finer in this uh, scale okay i'll change yeah there seems to be some waveforms uh, which is uh, finer which is present there um, in this uh, thing which is i don't know what the source of that noise but you basically get the idea right how do you go about uh, looking at different channels you can turn on channel 4 for example you can turn on channel 3 so there are four channels now okay and you can read off the waveform uh, by looking at it at different time scales as well as by looking at it at a, a different uh, voltage scales suppose uh, you would like to uh, move this waveform down so you can use this knob the y position so uh, this entire block here is for y vertical control and this entire block here is for horizontal control okay that is time so i want to move this down 
and bring it down here so that the all the waveforms are sort of equally spaced on the oscilloscope for clear uh, readout. Now in this scope the zero voltage is actually indicated by this uh, these arrows here for two it is here for four channel number four it is here for channel number three it is here for channel number one it is here and so on so you can change the basic zero position of each of these channels so this waveform for example if you look now you can see it is not centered around zero right at least in this time scale so you can see that it is having a uh, off center here that's partly an illusion because uh, the signal is uh, really like that and it was being triggered at some point here okay so it's not really a uh, non uh, or zero uh, it was just an illusion but there could be cases like that the point is you can read off how much voltage it is from this zero by reading it from the zero marker indicated for that channel another device that uh, you would use uh, in the lab is a multimeter and you, many of you may be familiar with this device uh, it is a combination of uh, many of the common uh, electrical measurement devices which uh, include the voltmeter uh, the ammeter an ohm meter and this is at least the basic uh, kind of measurements that you can make with a multimeter quite often uh, many multimeters come with a much more uh, variety of measurements Quite often, multimeter also enables uh, measurement of other kinds of uh, parameters like the capacitance, um, maybe HFE of a transistor, and some of them even come with a diode tester, um, a continuity checker, ports for measuring uh, light intensity, humidity, um, temperature, some of them can measure sound pressure level. And here is a simple uh, multimeter that you can uh, um, see uh, in this uh, of course there's a turn on button and this knob is used to uh, select which kind of measurement it is that you're going to make so uh, here currently it is uh, placed a, it was a meter and in a 2 oh, milliamp scale some of the multimeters may be auto ranging meaning you don't have to go and select the range in which you uh, have to make the measurements okay um, and here are the two points which you will be used connecting to the points where you're making the measurements from it's a voltmeter you will it will measure the voltage across these points uh, if it is used as an ohm meter it will you connect the resistors across this if you are measuring capacitance you connect the lead of the capacitors to these two points and so on okay and we will see uh, how this is used in the next uh, step so here is a uh, multimeter in uh, real life okay and let us turn this on and you can see uh, currently it is uh, placed in the voltage uh, measurement settings and it is put in two volt uh, range so let us take a common 1.5 volt it's an old battery uh, let us see what happens when we connect the probes to the two ends it can also measure uh, resistance so we have to change this into the resistance uh, measurement mode and what I have is something like 3.3 uh, kilo ohm 5% tolerance resistance so I will be changing this into this 20 kilo ohm range and use this uh, leads to make the measurement and you can see it is showing a 3.3 uh, kilo ohm resistance and so it's uh, within the 5% tolerance. Another um, device that you will uh, use uh, for studying the circuits is this breadboard. And as you can see here, um, it is a device to connect different um, points of uh, electrical um, elements. So the basic schematic uh, is uh, as shown here. There are these uh, sockets which are appearing as dots here. I will demonstrate it uh, shortly. Uh, and all these points are connected together. But across this way, these are not connected. And if you look at the bank here, which are uh, two banks on the edges here, there the connection is all along this line. In some of them, you may see that there's a break here. 
in some of the breadboards. Um, otherwise, there are these two blocks, this block, this block, and in these two blocks, connections are like this. But between these blocks, there are no connections. This block and this block are similar, where the connections are horizontal. Okay, so that's what's about um, breadboard. Now, if we come to if you come to a real uh, breadboard, uh, this is uh, how it is, and uh, I have sort of connected uh, a uh, integrated circuit here between these uh, two blocks. As you can see, uh, if I take uh, this point, all these points are connected. So whenever I want to connect to this lead, I will insert the element lead into this point, like this. For example, this resistance is connected, and suppose I want to connect this to this lead then I will take this and connect like this. Now this point is connected to this point through these resistors. Okay, So that's basically how this uh, a breadboard can be used to make connection between um, uh, points of or leads of uh, um, components. Okay, You may use such leads to uh, bridge long distances okay so now this would imply that uh, this point is connected to entire line here because in this particular breadboard uh, there is a break here another device uh, that you will uh, use to uh, learn to build some experimental setups or say stimulus application recording something monitoring something in your uh, experimental setup is uh, this uh, arduino board Okay, so you will, uh, in the course of this um, uh, lab, you will also build some experimental setup making use of this Arduino. And this is basically a small computer which can be programmed to monitor certain uh, sensors, transducers, and also drive certain devices like relays, uh, LEDs, and so on. So we'll make use of that to, say, construct a PER experiment or an ERG uh, experiment to using only this board and some amplifier which you will build on the breadboard. Uh, though you have already seen an oscilloscope, here is an oscilloscope which you will be using for your experiment because uh, first of all it, may, it can be compact and it can be turned on like this. Uh, it has a built-in uh, signal generator which can be used for your experiment. So you can, it's compact and very easy for us to use. So I will be using this uh, oscilloscope uh, for uh, experiments uh, uh, with circuit elements. Okay, it's not a full-fledged signal generator, but it can give a certain discrete set of frequencies uh, which you can switch. Okay, um, and it can only monitor one channel, which is uh, uh, sufficient for uh, most of our purposes. Okay. 